Social ecology is based on the conviction that nearly all of our present ecological problems originate in deep-seated social problems. It follows from this view that these ecological problems cannot be understood, let alone solved, without a careful understanding of our existing society and the irrationalities that dominate it. To make this point more concrete, economic, ethnic, cultural, and gender conflicts, among many others, lie at the core of the most serious ecological dislocations we face today. The notion that man must dominate nature emerges directly from the domination of human by human. It was not until organic community relation dissolved into market relationships that the planet itself was reduced to a resource for exploitation. This centuries-long tendency finds its most exacerbating development in modern capitalism. Owing to its inherently competitive nature, bourgeois society not only pits humans against each other, it also pits the mass of humanity against the natural world. Just as men are converted into commodities, so every aspect of nature is converted into a commodity, a resource to be manufactured and merchandised wantonly. The plundering of the human spirit by the marketplace is paralleled by the plundering of the earth by capital. Until society can be reclaimed by an undivided humanity that will use its collective wisdom, cultural achievements, technological innovations, scientific knowledge, and innate creativity for its own benefit and for that of the natural world, all ecological problems will have their roots in social problems. The old world is ending. And we have the opportunity to rethink everything. This is a show about the systemic problems in our world. And the real solutions we have today. To transition from an apocalyptic storm of war, scarcity, and ecological collapse. To create an abundantly advanced collaborative society. That sustains all life. You may think it's an impossible dream. But the alternative is an inevitable nightmare. We're your hosts, Matt Holton, Amanda Smith, and Zachary Marlowe. And together, we can move past this economic absurdity and come together to actualize our collective potential to create something completely new. We are Mindless Society. Society. Howdy, y'all. Welcome to another episode of Moneyless Society. As society collapses all around us, Crunching down on a, on a nice fresh carrot from the pesticide and, and soaked uh, grocery store shelves. And just thinking about the collapse of society. Light stuff, you know, hanging out with my friends online, just waiting for the grid to collapse, waiting for the, uh, waiting for my neighbors to come at me and take all my water, you know, all those things like that. So today joining us, we have a very special guest, Andy from the Poor Pearls Almanac. Which is a pod, kind of a, a a a prepper podcast about agroecology. Um, it, it's a very it's a very wide ranging show that deals with everything from episodes on hydrogen to the history of cannabis to uh, revolutionary histories, the Irish potato famine, very specific deep dives on individual plants and coppicing and farming techniques, and it's a great show that I am astounded as as popular as it is because I think a lot of people know. Uh, shit's about to hit the fan. So that's kind of what I would like to get into today to bring Andy in here to talk about prepping for utopia or collapse. Or as I like to say, prepping for collapse, hoping for utopia. So Andy, um, what what do you see in the world <laughs> that makes you want to store up big piles of beans and uh, plant lots of trees and things like that? What's up? What's up with that? Everything's fine, right? <laughs> Marl, first off, thanks so much for having me on. Um, yeah, you know, it's hard to not look around at what's happening around the world and say, this this is not sustainable. Uh, I, I think everyone's seen it. I think um, the term that I think has become more popular in the past year or two is the crumbles. And I think that's really accurate in describing what we're we're starting to feel, whether it's shortages for, you know, basic parts for trucks and cars or... Uh, you know, you go to the grocery store and suddenly 
there's cheese on the shelves, just not the cheese you were looking for. And those will become more and more common. And it's not going to be this big TV type collapse where something, you know, one day you go outside and there's no power, there's no one picking up your trash, all those different things. Instead, you're just going to have these slow, you know, uh, disconnection of resources and things like that. And that's, that's what we have to think about preparing for is how do we be, how do we find the ways to not necessarily, um, fill those gaps, but figure out how to live in a way that is, uh, more in alignment with the resources that are available for us. And how do we make those resources available for us? We were talking a minute ago about like the inspiration to this show, your show, that you were on a long tribe with somebody and just getting into this conversation about all these bad things that are happening and and kind of chronicling them. And I, I always love to meet other people that just kind of get it, you know, that like I, I remember um, when COVID popped off, the first round anyway, um, I was at the grocery store and I overheard this woman like complaining to a manager about like, where's all the food? And and uh, she she said something like I, I asked her, like, lady, where do you think food comes from? You know, and she said, like, uh, the grocery store, obviously, like she just did not understand that food is something that comes out of the ground that is reliant upon this whole, you know, like web of, of uh, natural forces coming together and balancing themselves harmoniously. Not only that, but like these super fragile five continent supply chains, you know, that we're dependent upon all this extraction from all over the world and all these inputs. And, you know, all of our products are assembled, you know, in five different places and then shipped across on ships. And it's just so fragile and it's so brittle. And we have no idea, really, most people, just how close we are to everything just like a light switch going out like our electrical grid, like our, our healthcare system, our monetary system to, we will, we, you know, we, we won't even get started on that. But I just, I'm curious, what is it that like you see in the world and what really like helped you to, to see what you see, to know what you know? Uh, I don't feel like I know anything. So <laughs> unfortunately, uh, you know, it's one of those things. I feel like if you just think that everyone is a rational person, you put yourself in those people's positions and think what what would be your best solution. And I think we saw that play out a bit with COVID where um, you have, when COVID started kind of creating these shortfalls that were inevitably going to happen under uh, the continuous extractive method that we live under, um, we saw people start becoming more creative and more resilient, whether it's um, finding simple ways to to access things or to repurpose things, retool the resources that we have. Um, the reality is that despite the fact, and I'm going to use this word that may not be the right word, despite the fact that we've been completely domesticated, um, we still are very creative and have a ton of resources at our disposal, even if the the bigger infrastructure starts to kind of settle and crack and break in certain places. We're really creative and really talented at finding ways to make things work. And with the internet, we have the capacity to to get those resources. And you know, somebody who's really good at engineering can figure out a solution and post it on YouTube. And then meme pages can repost it. And suddenly everyone has access to this piece of information that even if only one engineer out of, I don't know, a million in the United States figured it out, that's all we need because of the way we're e uh, equally connected. Super quick thing, and this is really pedantic, but I just noticed like all the, the cooking videos on the internet, everybody realized that you can put a chopstick down and like make this tornado cut into things and then like make an accordion out of them. And I just saw that <laughs> spread so quickly. And it's such a small, silly thing, but it really just shows how powerful the internet is that's, that these solutions and the kind of things that you talk about on your show you know, of, of these farming techniques and these ways to preserve water and, you know, these battery technologies, whatever it is that, you know, we, there are these solutions out there. I just did an episode of a, like kind of a private episode on like uh, creating off grid internet with somebody and that stuff can spread really quickly on the internet. Sorry, Amanda, uh, I think you. I was just going to say, you know, that's what I love about uh, Andy's show is the fact that it provides this, um, from what I, from what I've gathered, a never before seen level of accessibility to the information that we need to be sustainable, to be fortified as individuals and as communities. Obviously that's, um, you know, center uh, to creative regenerative living. Um, you know, uh, from, from ourselves, you know, into our environment with our agriculture. Uh, 
so collapse is everyone's favorite term. <clears throat> Excuse me. Preppers are known to be, you know, preparing for collapse. And I haven't listened to all of your episodes by far. I think you're on like 116, right? But what I don't hear uh, a mention of very much is the word transition. And I'm just wondering from your perspective, someone who's really like elbow deep in this in this prep lifestyle, um, do you see this as a transition or just a f or just getting ready for a full collapse and then picking up the pieces and going from there? And a uh, the bonus question, would, would you rather it, you know, be more of a transition than actually um, seeing the whole world as we know it uh, crumble? So uh, I think this points to a really interesting understanding of our relationship with the world around us. And that's, um, we think about are we in the early stages of collapse and my my like can i swear on this definitely yeah okay uh my my smartest hell yeah response, so I can, can. <laughs> yes you like freaking my... can heck yeah <laughs> no teachers um, no parents no masters right uh so <laughs> me being the troublemaker that i was my first like like i said smart ass response is usually like well you're thinking about it wrong. And at what point have we ever not been in transition? And we've, oh, we think of tra the problem is we think of the, the time we're in from the context that we understand it. And historically speaking, we are in uh, what is basically going to be an immeasurable outside of the, the carbon emission component blip. Well, and the other chemicals we've dumped into the ground blip in the course of human history. You know what? What we're experiencing is the uh, basically the the effects of a hundred, two hundred years, um, and that has been a transition period. And in in a sense, we've never really stopped transitioning. Um, so being worried about like this weird cutoff, I think, is almost like our our deconstruction our deconstructionist. No, that's not the right the word. Um, our, our ability to try to break things down into pieces and um, into conceivable pieces. Yeah. Into inconceivable pieces that kind of tries to set like a, uh, like with, like with um, all this stuff with like, you know, carbon emissions, like we have to cut, you know, carbon emissions down to X amount by this date. Um, and it's in reality, it's just an arbitrary date. Like the, you know, yeah. that in the scope of things, like, it doesn't matter if it's that, you know, if it's the next day, is that going to be too late? Like, no, it, you know, everything's on a spectrum. So the idea that like from movies and the way that we, we relate with everything, um, that we, we would expect this day to just come and be like this, like, like I said, you go outside and no one's picking up trash and you know, the, there's fire coming from the sky or whatever, you know, that whatever your vision <laughs> of collapse looks like, like that, that may exist someday, but it's not going to be like this random. For me, it's, it's hearing beat. that Justin Bieber song, uh, yummy, um, coming out of the sky, you know, as this, as a portal <laughs> of fire opens up. I mean, you know, I can't wait for that day. The four horsemen, they did mention Justin Bieber. I, <laughs> Very specifically, remember. That. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. I I, I went to uh, Sunday school. Is he the Antichrist? He. It all makes sense when you think about it. Um, no, really. The uh, to not go on a too long of a tangent, but the the Antichrist is the corporation. It's it's a, the corpse, the the corpus. You know, it's this disembodied nice. and corporation. It Beautiful has no body, no physical form. Yet it it like yeah. uh, has in, enveloped it and encompassed the world. They're all. they're invisible. Yeah. They're everywhere. You know, like or money itself really is like the Holy Spirit is the anti Holy Spirit. The Christ is this disembodied and corporate disincorporation of spirit that permeates all of us, and yet we're all held together in this world by this matrix of ones and zeros that are floating through us in beams of five G radiation and. And uh, yeah, that's that's the Antichrist. I'm not sure if I'm about to get baptized or if I'm going to get like sucked out of this world into whatever world we live in outside of it to be like, see, is that what you expected? <laughs> <laughs> but, that's that's uh, a very profound thing to be asked when you get sucked out of the material world. Is that what you expected? Yeah. Well, that's yeah. your fault, dummy, for having expectations. Back to the wheel yeah. of some sorrow for you. <laughs> Attachments. Uh... You know, I... Uh, this is continue on that tangent just a little bit. Uh, I interviewed Chris Fox for a different podcast. He's a theoretical whoa, whoa, whoa. physicist. I said you can swear, but I don't. I don't want you to. You know, you, you don't want to swear every word. Okay, I'm just kidding. sorry. Go ahead, Doctor Chris Fox. Um, and <laughs> that's my. Can you help like, me no, learn how to give a fuck again? New, 
right? <laughs> he has a name. great name that he does not, not appreciate or fan. utilize to its full potential. <laughs> but he's, uh, uh, we were talking about the multiverse and I was like, it's always been like one of those really like satisfying, like, well, in another world, things are better. And he's like, yeah, it's bullshit. And I was like, why would you do that to me? I needed that. That, that was keeping me alive. He and he's like, bubble. sorry, it's just, it's not true. He's like, I vehemently disagree with it. It's ex- that it's like even possible. So a multiverse. Uh, that there are infinite, he says that there are, go ahead. I was just going to say it's impossible. The, the multiverse, he, he disagrees with that concept. He says it's impossible. Yes. yes he says it doesn't, That's it doesn't disappointing. make any sense. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was like, you know, listen, I needed to know in another world, like things worked out better for me. Yeah. You know, well, that was I'm, let, I'm, I'm seriously let like, down. Was, yeah, I was like, I'm taking one for the team, like all the other Andes out there. I got this one. You guys chill. Enjoy your life. Sounds like episode of Rick and Morty. Right. I've always conceived of it as like there are there are infinite, like every possible choice, every possible outcome of every flip of the coin is its own you know extant reality that goes on in perpetuity I mean, well and, and there, if that were the so. case then there would That's be the there, would, there would be a never-ending there would be a never-ending uh you know ongoing introduction of new realities and every single moment from seven billion people on the planet every making every choice and every millisecond you know do, do i stand up this second or next second to go get the apple from the kitchen and if i stand up next second what what alternate reality oh does God. that hold? Oh my God. You're blowing <laughs> my mind. Stop. Because that means you don't make any decisions. You're just fulfilling a path of one of your infinite choices that you would inevitably take. Right. Okay. I'm we need to, to make exact consumer choices in the in our in our, uh, our creation of realities in the metaverse. We are uh, we are choosing to consume the wrong realities, and we need to. You know, be more. Uh, sorry, we're going. We're getting. We're getting lost on a tangent here. We're supposed to be talking about the apps and the end of the world. And... <laughs> so, oh, I was. I yeah, was I mean... curious too. Um, just for our for our listeners also, just to kind of pull us back on on uh, the subject, maybe also. I was. I haven't listened to a lot of your show yet either. I must admit, I've just been so busy with everything that I've been doing with with this book release and all this other stuff. But I was curious too. Um, how did you get into the whole uh, regenerative agricultural movement? Because I've kind of gotten into that myself lately, and. And uh, that's just kind of one of the things that I've found a lot of value in that, you know, that we're kind of promoting. And um, I was just curious, like, how long you've been doing that? What brought you into that world originally? Um, you know, and, and how you kind of combine those. Into it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and how you kind of combine those philosophies with the other, you know, with the other things. Like, why is it important, essentially, you know? Yeah, so um, my uh, my parents are immigrants and they came from uh, southern Italy. Uh, my grandfather was a farmer over there. And when he came to the United States, you know, he was the house basically that I grew up in was like you drive through, um, you know, any like urban ish kind of neighborhood that's like, you know, row houses or whatever. And you see the one house that's got like the grapevines over the driveway, like, you know, the garden up to the fence. Like that was basically where I grew up. And, uh, you know, I went to college, kind of like disassociated with that a little bit, graduated and then started, you know, this is 15, 20 years ago now, kind of thinking about what I wanted in life and what made me satisfied and getting my hands dirty was it. And um, I got into, I stumbled into working in nonprofits and the nonprofit ended up uh, absorbing uh, a giant greenhouse, basically. So then I became Hmm. a greenhouse manager. And, oh. you know, then it just kind of snowballed from the, the traditional, I want to use organic fertilizers, I want to do more than organic, you know, and you just kind of slowly go down this rabbit hole. And that's kind of where how I ended up where I am today. I mean, not so much the, the podcast side of things, mm-hmm. but in terms of, uh, I guess, my agricultural leanings. And uh, in terms of pairing that with, I guess, like my politics and my perspective on the world, um, one of the things that I try to kind of underscore with all of the the content in the podcast is really highlighting um, the the idea of permaculture versus how we should be thinking about our relationship with ecosystems, and uh, that you know, kind of w- what uh, Amanda had brought up earlier about this idea of like, uh, is there going to be a cutoff? Is there like a transition? And um, you know, kind of reframing the conversation not in our current era, but thinking 
bigger picture, longer term in terms of like humanity on this landscape and mm-hmm. what, what traditional methods have managed this landscape successfully and how should that impact the way we um, steward that landscape today. And uh, that's where I feel like a lot of the regenerative agriculture, permaculture falls really short because instead of learning about how your specific landscape was managed three, four, 500 years ago, Instead, we're going to books and instructors and th- that have no relation to that place and mm. say, I learned to do this. And let's talk about these layers of a permaculture you know, system. And how does this relate to how the landscape was managed? It doesn't. It, it doesn't honor the people who, have here, who were here and are still here today. And it also actively erases them in many ways, while also... Mm. Um, stealing a lot of that knowledge that's being, you know, taken out of context and then just, you know, smashed onto a landscape like a stamp. And it doesn't really belong there in many cases. And of course, there are always good instructors in permaculture and regenerative agriculture, and there are bad. But I think as a system, it, its construct is fundamentally opposed to like the concept of anarchism and the way I perceive, at least, um, how we should uh, relate and steward and think about our place within a, a bigger context. Can you can you talk more about that bigger context and those anarchist principles and um sure no uh, how much time you <laughs> yeah. got? <laughs> yeah, so no I, I just wanted to clarify something to you. So you said some of these principles in regenerative agri- regenerative agriculture and permaculture they actually kind of go against some of the principles in anarchism and stuff like that or I'm sorry, did I hear that right or did I misinterpret yes, that? Yes, um, in the sense that, okay, so, and this is where I think I, I disagree with many anarchists, so you might not mm-hmm. take the same perspective as I do. When sure. we think about, or when we look at places like Rojava, uh, the Zapatistas, and um, most major successful anarchist movements, um, the defining component that is um, a lot of times missed is the the need for a community driven decision-making process and what their Mm. community looks like. Now, permaculture comes from, uh, you know, a handful or two folks in particular studying in Australia and saying, this is the way to do permaculture. And then just kind of taking that and saying that applies in New England, that applies in Canada, that applies in Florida. Mm. And there's a little bit of wiggle room on that, but at no point does it say, what were the people who lived here that stewarded this land for thousands of years do? And how does that get, how do we bring that into the worlds that we want to see in the future in this landscape? And how, how does that landscape inform and that histories, the history of that landscape inform how we're managing and stewarding and incorporating the people there to make a, a better future, you know, longer term, not just, you know, the, as long as the trees you plant there are there, but long after your memory is gone and anything you've ever done is gone. And that's mm-hmm. where, again, we, we have a tendency to kind of forget that we're just this little blip in history. And it's not our job to rewrite history. It's our job to keep that continuity going as much as we can. And it's really easy to just fall back on saying, read Murray Bookchin or, you know, to go take this PDC class where they're going to teach you how to grow more food. And, you know, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll pick on Jeff Lawton for a moment. Uh, if you're familiar with the name, he's pretty big right now. I think he's probably the most popular name in permaculture that's alive today. Mm-hmm. And if you just look at his own posts on Instagram, he basically will say, oh, we went into uh, Indonesia and got them to stop burning the landscape to put in to apply permaculture principles. And it's like, well, the Sweden landscape or the Sweden slash and burn method of agriculture has successfully kept people fed in those regions with notoriously poor soils for thousands of years. And you're mm-hmm. going to tell them that they're wrong with quote unquote, you know, indigenous agriculture of Australia. Like it, it, the second that you start to break down the way permaculture is presented and uh, really put some pressure on it and push back on it, you start to see this very colonialist, uh, system come out of mm. it uh, because it doesn't engage with that place and that time and that history because that's hard and that's complicated and you can't just replicate that everywhere. Exactly, and, you can't conform ecosystems and how you uh, exactly how you tend to them. 
Yeah, yeah and, and especially the old cultures too. And that, that, I was kind of curious too. What if you come across a culture that's like, I mean, how do you, it, 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 when you come across situations like that, I think it's kind of, it, it does make it complicated, you know, and, and it's hard to, it's hard to say exactly what the best solution is cut and dry, you know, because it's not like there's a good versus a bad. It's, it's a lot of different, uh, you know, possibilities or a lot of different potential choices, each with their own, you know, consequences, essentially. And, and a lot of them fall across a spectrum. You know, and it's just kind of, I think that's kind of one of the things that I reiterate a lot too, is you got to look at individual areas and assess the culture, assess the geography, you know, the climate and everything else there, you know, to come up with solutions for each individual area. And even then it's not like we're coming up with, we got to work with people around the world, you know, and, and communicate with them and, you know, really kind of get to the, you know, common understandings of what it is, you know, situations that work for everybody, I guess, essentially, you know. Bi yeah. Bioregionalism. I mean, there, there's a, a mm. need to not uh, attempt to map, I mean, in all areas, not just in terms of agriculture and, you know, what the soil likes and doesn't like, but we, we can't essentially map, you know, I mean, this is the essence of colonialism is saying, this is the correct culture, you're doing it wrong, <laughs> and we need to do this. But there is, an, there is right. another sort of side to that. And I think there are a lot of principles within permaculture as a philosophy and as a set of sort of essential uh, ways of seeing things, of seeing nature as a living system. I mean, maybe it's entry level to some people to go from, you know, growing things in a strip or in a row to actually thinking about them in a living system, in as a holistic mm -hmm. organism, as an ecosystem. I think that that line of thinking, and I think that intention in people who are practicing that, I think is good. And so, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'm not I'm not a, a, a the most accomplished you know person in the fields of agriculture and things like that. But I do respect the intention, and I think it in all areas, it's always best to just tell everybody that you disagree with, go further. You know, like we all need to go further. And I think it, to sort of jump from back and forth between the social element of this and the political element and agricultural, um, as we we've talked many times online about, like you know, you just just posting you know the right ideology or posting this dogma or trying to engage with people in this way, approaching your average person on the street, you know, or the person in your community or at the farmer's market or whatever with talking about, you know, democratic confederalism and syndicated mycelial networks that, you know, like we can't approach people like that. We have to create a new political language that is bioregional, that is really unique to every person we're talking to. But we do need to, I think, especially in this age of uh, essential disintegration, where the disintegrations and the flames and the you know candor of water breaking through structure is essentially the same everywhere that we go. And so we do need to develop these essential values, these essential principles that hold us together, that value life, that you know stress interdependence. And so I would love to actually to indulge that um, view of how do you see both anarchism, I mean, it's kind of a two-part question, and it's another pretentious, hefty, lofty question, but how do you see the potential for both anarchism and for an agroecological, uh, regenerative sort of agricultural practice being a solution to the crumbling, collapsing society as a consequence of our changing climate and the other cascading effects of us fucking nature for 200 years, for 5,000 years, really? For so Longer. <laughs> Yeah, so Sorry. I, I'm gonna dig in anywhere you like there. <laughs> Pardon yeah. the pun. One of the things that we're seeing, I think that's really important, and I, we, we tend to look at it as a, a negative, and I think it actually offers some really great opportunity is the the um the splitting of you know the extremism that's happening in this country in terms of people either swinging to the left and saying that like this isn't working and then people swing to the right saying this isn't working and that can be very dangerous for obvious reasons that said i do think um pushing people towards right libertarianism isn't necessarily a bad thing i think those are people that are much more willing to engage in the conversations that we have and i think they're much more understanding of the concept that like if you don't trust the government and you don't trust and you probably don't trust Jeff Bezos, then like there's not a whole lot of other stuff we need to kind of figure out and be on the same page about that we aren't yet already. Hmm. And when we start talking about like an eco focused uh, solution, uh, solution for the way we're living and creating sustainability and, you know, regenerativeness or whatever term you want to throw in there when we have these conversations with people, I think especially 
rural libertarians offer a lot of opportunity because of the fact that they understand the value of working with nature. You can create ecosystems that create abundant populations of deer or rabbit or whatever, and they can see how, you know what, planting persimmon trees that are native to this region increase the amount of you know, hunting I can do while also feeding me. And, and that's a great alternative to planting, uh, you know, whatever, you know, permaculture tree is like the, the hip new thing right now. Um, you know, building that relationship of how the ecosystem creates uh, a healthier, more dynamic um, surplus of foods for us and the things that we can hunt or just to, to create more resilience against rainfall and all of these different things, people that are outside. And this is kind of the crux of what I usually talk about is like, we just need to go outside. We will find common ground when we get there. Because if, if I sit down and talk to, when I was in the trade, when I was younger, uh, I was a carpenter and I would talk to these guys who are old hunters, you know, all boomers. And, you know, they'd be talking about how, it's so weird that it's not, there's no snow on the ground when they're hunting like it used to be. And, you know, and I'd be like, yeah, that's climate change. And they're like, no, not like that. And, you know, you just kind of look at them like you're, you are admitting you're seeing this thing happen. And as I've gotten older, I've realized that like, yeah, I can't use that language. We are on the same page, but he will never admit we're on the same page. And there's, there's so much opportunity for us to build inroads through understanding our relationship with nature, with that libertarian rural right population that we're not engaging with because they're aesthetically more challenging um, maybe than other groups of the population that we would like to find common ground with and radicalize. I think that one of the best ways to observe how, um, you're, as you were stating, um, how we can relate to nature and form relationships and see the similarities in ourselves and the world around us that we refer to as nature as if it's separate, um, is to observe something called companion planting, which I think is what Marlo was essentially uh, referring to a few moments ago when he was talking about the contrast between monoculture planting at one one plant in a row, you know, dozens of rows, hundreds of acres, monoculture. Uh, versus companion planting, where when you dive into that and learn how those plants collaborate to survive, to thrive, to grow, and to come to fruition, you understand that that's exactly how community works. Um, you know, you may have a plant that has a root system that fortifies the water retention of this plant that you've planted it next to. You may have a plant that acts as a uh, natural pesticide to the plants around it, you know. And so essentially every plant in that ego, that little ecosystem has a role. And, and together, this little community comes up out of the dirt and becomes this beautiful, thriving, fruiting community that feeds life. Uh, and so for me, at least, that uh, companion planning is something I think that if you want to understand better how our um, complex nature operates and just how social we really are look into that form of gardening and farming uh to, to to and maybe even get your hands in the dirt and and start practicing it to to understand how how integral we really are to each other's existence let alone uh to each other's thriving i want to jump from uh, again back into the social uh, ecological element of this and um i think that in bringing around those people who have those problematic views who have, you know, I think generally all people, since we're all essentially bipedal hominids that, uh, you know, breathe oxygen and like food. And, you know, there's just all these things that we have in common, all of us, no matter where we are, no matter where we live, that we do have more in common than we don't. And most of the things we do have and don't have in common are a political narrative and a story that we've accepted, which separate and divide us. But I think that in the uh, solutionary sort of uh, toolkit, or the way of thinking about how do we fix these people, not fix these people, but how do we bring about companion planting uh, in, in the human organism, in the, in the garden of our social relationships? Mm. I think that I think about those people that, you know, like there's a person out there, not a platform, not a book, not a political ideology that can fix that person or, or, or transform their thoughts, but there is a person out there that. You know, if you connect that person and plant them next to that problematic individual who has this thing, who's like, like I, I think, I think about algorithms a lot. I think a lot about 
the usage of the beneficial usage of artificial intelligence and the sort of algorithms that you know we all sort of met through through this weird internet sphere you know despite their malicious programming to harvest us our lives and dreams you know to sell advertisements that they bring people together and that technology like that could analyze these people and say okay i detect this sort of you know anti-social or anti-ecological behavior or thought but they can also say okay look so and so likes to hunt and fish and likes to get his hands dirty and likes carpentry you know and and it, you can say okay andy likes to i guess hunt fish carpentry you know get his hands dirty do demo on his kitchen you know uh take a big bite of a carrot every now and then i even connect those two people and that's the best thing that's going to bring those people closer to each other you know is finding somebody and forming that relationship i say this all the time arguments don't change people's minds political ideologies don't often change people's minds somebody's mind kind of has to be open and cracked and then you plant that seed and it sprouts but the way to bring those people's out of the darkness of that ignorance is through cultivating relationships with each other. And I think that's the job of a social ecologist, not just as a, a, a highfalutin philosophical term, but as an actual role in society. And that's primarily one of my roles is trying to do th what we're doing in this sort of the rooms of these shows is bring people together and connect other people and connect the dots to say, okay, you know, in, in that metaphor of like, nitrogen fixing plants you know we need to find people like you who are connected with that rural lifestyle with the true heritage with the true roots of what it is to be american you know which is to be self-reliant and you know to be tethered to the land and and you know all of those things have just been utterly smashed by corporations by this ethos of propertarians as bookchin called libertarians these people who respect property rights above all other rights who have just hijacked this whole you know uh, colonial enterprise to make it into the you know their shape, which is you know this pyramid crushing all life, and so that that I think is one of the biggest roles in creating this change is in bringing uh, the the right people together, not just the right words and ideas. Yeah, I think um, one thing again, I, I feel like as much uh, I feel like a lot of the things I say end up not being like very popular among anarchists, um, but like. I am of the the belief that Join the, the goal isn't that everyone should be an anarchist. Like it is okay. And I am fully in support of like conservatives existing on the earth and like people having different opinions than me. Like we should not be advocating for this idea of group think like our diversity and different opinions and understandings and perspectives allows for us to challenge ourselves on both sides of the spectrum and maybe find that some of us are wrong. Like we, we under, we're under this illusion that there's like this objective truth and that doesn't exist and that we are the purveyors of this truth. And again, if it doesn't exist, that that's a very quick way to go down a rabbit hole. And like, it, you're not going to sol solve any problems with that. So like, I'm cool with conservatives being around and liberals and you know everyone else that I may not agree with, but like, we we all need pushback. It's healthy for a society to have a diversity of opinions and expectations. Well, I think that like a lot of these people that I talk to online that are anarchists, it's like, are you an anarchist or are you a regular American consumer with no political power and no ability to enact this vision on the world? I'm not going to say that there aren't people out there actually building decentralized autonomous communities, and forming these relationships think because there are. And I think of all the leftists out there, those are the people that I see doing shit the most. But I think most of leftism as we see it is a big fucking LARP. You know, it's a costume that we wear online. And in reality, it's not really affecting that much outside of ourselves and our own lives, you know, and really like, yeah, I mean, I, I think about like when you said the word conservative, because I, I agree and I disagree with that because there is like no allowable tolerance for like a political platform based on ecocide. Like we cannot keep doing this. We cannot keep burning fucking coal and things like that. And these things are sadly intertwined in that conservative identity. But I think a way to get to people is to approach them, not to say your belief is wrong, but to find a way to go inside their belief and say, okay, let's break down the word conservative. It's about conservation, right? You should be about conserving resources, right? So you shouldn't be for a system that is based upon wasting as much resource as fast as possible you know, to turn a profit. You should be for preserving your natural habitat. You should be for uh, you know, not spoiling 
you know, the land that you, that your children are going to run and play through and your drinking water and all these things, you know, I think that, you know, just changing our language really can allow us, as you said earlier, like not using the word, the politically charged words in the conversation, but changing the lingo that we use, it allows us to enter into those people's worlds in a way that is very powerful. I was just going to say really quickly, because uh, we want to hear more from you, Matt. You've not said much this episode, and you are the regenerative guy in this group. Oh. Um, but uh, I haven't made a reference to TVP in a while. And uh, what Marlo is describing, uh, for me at least, rings a bell. Uh, the Venus Project would propose that you know telecommunication is the way to move forward, to find that common ground, be able to work on a productive level with people, essentially collaborate without having to deal with uh, really charged, intense emotions that, you know, are, are futile to progress. Uh, it, it's a matter, like Marlo was saying, uh, just getting, getting down to the context of what it is we're actually trying to convey. So we can get all these political, religious, you know, um, chord striking things out of the way and, and actually move forward together. And I, I was going to just kind of add on to that, too. I think a lot we, we have a lot more in common, you know, with conservatives and with libertarians and, and whatnot than we than we think. I think a lot of the time, you know, being someone that grew up in Texas myself and spent a lot of time around conservatives growing up and around Republicans. And, you know, I was I was actually pretty hardcore libertarian myself, probably about. 10 years ago or so after after the 2008 uh, I was I'm serious after the 2008 um you know whole financial crisis and everything I was like screw the monetary system we need gold <laughs> you know we need to go back to uh you know real money and this and that and the other and you know the, the kind of the more I learned about economics and whatnot I was just kind of like well that doesn't really seem like it's the you know, ideal solution either um you know but I, I think a, a lot of what conservatives want is essentially the same things that we want when when you boil it down you know to their to their core values which is you know just security for our families uh you know community uh prosperity we want we want an environment that provides for us you know and um i think it, it, a lot of the beliefs that have become intertwined with the political system kind of make it seem like the, we're we're going about those two different things and just completely you know, opposite ways. And they also make it seem like they're, we're heading in opposite directions, you know, when, when in reality, I think a lot of us are kind of heading in the same direction, just taking different routes to get there, you know, by, by developing, you know, the community, reinvesting in the environment, reinvesting in neighbors and people and things like that. And I, and I think if we, you know, kind of meet people on that level, like, you know, what it is, what it is that they really want. And, and not only that, just kind of relating to people's fears, I think, too, a lot of people do these things out of fear, essentially of yeah. something going wrong, the system kind of breaking down, um, you know, and there being some sort of negative consequences, you know, and, and how can we, I think a large portion of our, you know, quote unquote job, so to speak, is, is relating to those fears and saying, what fears are they, you know, that these people have? Are they the same fears that we are experiencing? And a lot of the time they probably are, you know, we're, we're saying to ourselves, we're, we're afraid of society collapsing. And that's a very legitimate fear to have, because we're all dependent upon each other, you know, to a large degree. And, um, you know, I mean, unless you're highly skilled, you probably don't know, you know, how to make everything that you need to survive, <laughs> you know, unless you've been purposefully doing that for a very long time, you know, myself included. Well, if I would listen have a very... to every episode of Andy's show. That's exactly. What I was <laughs> right. then you can do everything. Such a All right. All right. Show. You know, but, but I mean, uh, the average person doesn't have those skill sets, you know, and they're afraid, you know, genuinely and, you know, can you know, rightfully so afraid of society collapsing, of their property being taken, of uh, their rights and their freedoms being taken. You know, they look at, they look a lot of the propaganda that's been, been put out there, especially regarding socialism and communism and things like that. And they're, they're justifiably feared of an authoritarian stepping in and, you know, putting the crack down and, you know, doing roundups for people. And all, I mean, there's all kinds of crazy stuff that could happen, you know? So I think a lot of it is just kind of understanding that we want the same thing in a lot of ways. And, we, and we're even trying to go about creating those same things in a lot of ways. We're just not really, I think there's, a, there's a bridge in communication and, and just a bridge in the overall, the, the political system, I think has created a lot more of a, of a divide than is necessary and, and created more of a, um, 
I'd say what's essentially kind of boils down to a misunderstanding, you know, between a lot of the two sides in a lot of ways. And, and a lot of the time, I think, you know, when when I've had conversations with conservatives and with libertarians, we end up meeting in the middle a lot of the time, you know, just kind of like, you know, I, they're like, I do understand that, you know, I understand where you're coming from and, 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 and vice versa, you know, and, and, and I've able to kind of bridge that gap with a lot of people, you know, and it doesn't say, and it doesn't happen consistently. There's times it's completely gone the other direction as well, you know, but, um, I think I think we have a lot more in common with, you know, the people across the aisle a lot of the time than we would just like to admit sometimes. And I think a lot of that does have to do with, you know, just cooperation, community, working together to achieve these goals, you know, that are important to us of the regenerate, you know, regenerating our environment being a big one, producing prosperity, community abundance and, and things of that nature. So um, that was just the, one of the main points that I kind of wanted to make there, I think. Yeah, I, I I'd like to say um, for any for anyone who feels we're being too soft on the uh, emerging threat of fascism, which is absolutely real and terrifying. Um, you got clips of like that woman Lauren Boebert, like saying like <laughs> just like saying like we have the privilege to live in the end times. We're gonna die because Jesus is coming back. It's like oh that gosh. shit terrifies me. She's a terrifying <laughs> person, and that fear, that very real fear that uh, conservatives feel that they're being abandoned, that their world is being swallowed up. I, I remember the first uh, Q video anyone ever sent me. It was my Uncle Sonny, my old Uncle Sonny, who was always such a kind, nice man, you know, old old guy, salt of the earth, just hardworking, kind, intelligent. He said, we were talking a lot around like the Trump election, and he was, tra he was biting the Trump thing, hook, line, and sinker, and I was really trying to work with him. And we talked a lot. For months, we talked on, on Facebook. And he sent me this, he sent me this video, this, this Q video, and it was like describing neoliberalism. It was like, do you ever feel like, you know, nothing, you, you know, your an, an honest work, day's work is gone and that all your wages are going to someone else. And, you know, just describing like, oh, and jobs are being oversourced and or, or sourced over, sent overseas. And, you know, it's like these corporations, well, and it was just like, wow, you're describing neoliberalism. And then it was like, it was like, yes, 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 yes. And it was like, it's because the Democrats are lizards and they're killing the children and sucking their blood out of their heads. And then it's like, oh, okay, that's where you lose me, big dog. Because <laughs> what, what the, the genius of that propaganda is, is not ignoring it. And the whole Trump phenomenon was saying the system is fucking broken. And people cheered when they heard that because they know it's true. It just took that and it harnessed that fear, like the Q phenomenon harnessed i saw so many like women and new mothers who they tapped into their fear of their child being taken from them and like slaughtered in some clandestine ritual and you know like the elites are drinking their blood which they literally you know not literally but metaphorically they are drinking the blood of the youth to fuel themselves and give themselves this false longevity and power where it's a metaphorically very true it's a beautiful myth actually of like oh yeah this is a system of you know, all of these, this pyramidal system where there's this, you know, red rooms at the top where people are making decisions. It's, it's much more sophisticated and complex than that. It's much more systematic, but it's kind of true in that, you know, neoliberalism has taken over the world. And if a small group of people does in fact control everything, and there is a vast conspiracy that we call capitalism of individuals coming into groups to take resources and control them and steal the destiny and the lives of the future generations. So I think it, it's really important to not underestimate at any point how scary that is. But yeah, we we need to as a as a, a movement to oppose, you know, the death of the world and to to speak to that fear. We have to find ways to do better and to connect with those people because they are just the, the right wing is winning big time. They are crushing it right now, and there is no voice that's rising up and saying this is bullshit. And I think when we speak in the language of the op of the obvious not in a language that is drenched in technicality and all this stuff. When we just tell people, hey, hey, big dog, there's more debt than money forever. We are perpetually in debt to no one. Like the, the, when you really break down how the monetary system works, how taxes don't fund spending, how it's all just a, 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 a form of austerity to keep you working and not really in a, the sort of hard work that we respect, which is like hewing wood with your hands and like digging in the dirt and doing real hard work for your community, being of service to people. I think about my dad telling me about like they'd wake up in the middle of the night and go pull hoses to put people's houses out of, uh, on, that were on fire out. You know, they would help their neighbors who were sick harvest their corn. You know, they had this very communalistic spirit in their small towns that has been destroyed by suburban Trumpism that mm -hmm. people are af afraid of because their world is being eaten. 
Sorry, I'm, I'm going yeah, off. I mean, it points to a couple of things that I think are really important and don't get enough uh, attention on the left. And the first is that, A, the right, you know, it, the fact that it congregates quite literally at around churches is not a coincidence in the sense that, like, the the church is the the vehicle which organizes the the populist right in the sense that the community is held accountable because they're a real community not a bunch of people on the internet that can just log off and go back to you know whatever they're doing when they're not on the internet and they no one is ever going to say hey like you were saying earlier uh, Marlo that you can be radical on the internet and go back and do your desk job and it never affects the way you live your life. You don't integrate your political philosophy in the way you live. Whereas in right, right wing rural communities in particular that are still centered around like the church, there's an accountability that if you don't do the thing that everyone else is doing, everyone is going to know and you, someone is going to call you out on it eventually. And we don't have that on the left. We don't have uh, a church like, metaphorically or physically or anything. And to me, I feel like that's where ecology can be a, a place of congregation for us mm -hmm. and a way for us to organize and a way for us to hold each other accountable and a way for us to do, um, you know, any kind of uh, outreach through uh, some common ground that people, you know, instead of the church using, you know, food pantries or whatever, using the basement of the church for a food pantry, we can use the, the ecosystem around us to, to make those inroads with people and to have, you know, common ground discussions. And that's, that's really what we're missing. We don't have that at all. And I don't see us moving anywhere closer to having that while the right can continue to gain steam because they do. And that's how things like prohibition passed a hundred years ago. It wasn't, or even like uh, the fight for abortion. It had nothing to do with having a popular support. It had to do with a very well organized and motivated uh, grassroots organization that was centered around something greater than any of the individuals. So yeah, I mean, there is this great history of the working poor organizing, you know, to bring about changes in society. You know, it wasn't like, like, like liberal intellectuals and people, you know, um, in in some circle that's like devoted to some esoteric philosophy aren't the ones that brought about a minimum wage you know it was a rural working populace i mean i'm sure there were intellectual elements of that and that there were there was a much more literate population back then like noam chomsky talks about you know the average working person back in the era of mines and you know factories was was reading you know moby dick and shakespeare and and you know they were reading marxist literature they were reading at a much higher level than people generally do today but that propaganda spreads and has the power to spread, you know, through those circles. And I think there is a real need for a vision of a world to get back to. And that we need to simultaneously connect this to like, this is an American thing. Like I was so pissed off at Bernie Sanders through that whole campaign. that every time the word socialism came up, came up, he said, oh, we're going to be like Denmark. And, and, and he didn't say, oh, yeah, the minimum wage that you take for granted, not like your children not having to work. That's fucking socialism. Socialists did that. American working class socialists did that. I was furious that they never that he never said that. He never talked about that history. That that's what socialism is. It's workers coming together. You know, I mean it's it's a super polarizing term. It means a different thing to everybody. But that's when you look at like people like Eugene Debs running for pres for president from prison and you look at movements of people through history, American socialists with, you know, banners and flags and slogans saying we are the socialists, we are the communists, you know, the people that Murray Bookchin organized with in the Great Depression, you know, they were working class people fighting for rights, for control of their destiny, for the freedom and liberty and justice and all these things that America is supposedly, you know, in name only predicated upon. And when we throw that away, you know, we are missing out on a tremendous opportunity to say, oh, you like liberty. You like being free from tyranny. Oh, you like, you know, justice and equality. These are the words that we have been conditioned to fetishize forever. Um, but, you know, we, there is there. I have to be cautious, too, because I'm, I noticed on Twitter the other day that hashtag MAGA communism is spreading that 
we have we're in such a malicious echo chamber of like this the internet is this mutating culture where like these echo chambers are formed and they just like uh, like i thought about the new york city subway where there's like strains of fungus that don't exist anywhere else in the world because it's this like locked off <laughs> biome like this this eco wow. this habitat where like freakish horrible monsters are breeding that like we have maga communism right now where we have like national bolshevism and things like that that are spreading on the internet that are tapping into that which are ultimately putting it into this very fascistic lens so we, yeah we, we need a vision and i think that's what we're trying to articulate as our movement that there is a, a clear vision in response to our changing climate our disintegrating social system the the rampant rampant inequality and just the conditions that that other people's children all over the world are subjected to you know they don't have child labor laws in in you know the horn of africa they don't where where, where minerals are being mined you know that they, they have none of the the justice and the freedom and all these things that we you know don't really have but at least have a name in these places where our minerals and resources come from which don't have to because we have been severed from our, our connection to the productive means of the earth to you know grow life to grow food and and fiber and fuel and shelter that we have been severed from that we are not independent you know we've been ushered into these sprawling suburbs and and you know like country people hate that shit they don't want their their you know uh stomping ground turned into a parking lot with a walmart in it and you know they're suckered by that convenience but but really their lives are being stolen from them and we need to tap into that big time yeah i agree i think one of the things that we see is that we have a lot of commonalities with mm. the, the working class um we just have to do a little bit of we have to do a little bit of work trying to build those bridges and that that can sometimes be a little bit uncomfortable and that doesn't mean it's not worth it though part of building those relationships is really about finding that common ground and saying hey listen we don't want a walmart there either and what does it look like to to restore these landscapes and you'll have someone that doesn't care about invasive species until you start talking about deer populations or turkeys and how poor management uh, the lack of a savanna ecosystem has driven down populations of turkeys and things like that and you can find those common grounds and we can do that and in that process we can start thinking about the the bigger picture of how do we connect as a community hmm. what does it mean for us collectively to be a part of the ecology and i think that's where we can start to do more than just sit on the internet and be in this like echo chamber that is you know i guess valuable in some sense but in reality we're not accomplishing anything nothing gets out of the chamber that's why it's an echo chamber and breaking that wall breaking out of that echo chamber and making real connections with real people there's really nothing that can replace that and that's where we have to be willing to be mm -hmm. vulnerable and put ourselves out there and that that can be scary and that that's okay we can accept that and understand that it's for something bigger and with practice it'll get easier and building that community it takes that time I just wanted to pick up on a, a thread that's sort of been going through here and a word that keeps coming up and that's resources. And I, I think, you know, we couldn't go, th go through an episode of our show without sort of um, at least dipping into the sort of deeper systematic uh, solutions that we are working to advocate here. And that is essentially moving uh, one of your uh, pins or patches or uh, stickers says uh, like ecology is greater than economy or you know, moving away from economy toward ecology. And I think that is really the foundation of the larger shift that we're trying to advocate here is moving beyond money as uh, a substance, substanceless substance that is a man-made resource that does not have a true connection to any biophysical referent in ecology, in nature. So our monetary system is has nothing to do, has no, it literally cannot see nature. It externalizes it, which means it has no language for it. It doesn't know what it's life blind. It's energy blind. It's materials blind. It's all things. It's blind to reality as uh, Nate Hagen's book is called, but um, it, it, it doesn't see life. And so in the interest of trying to actually solve these global problems and ask the real questions of a changing climate, which is what re what is the resource that we have available here and what is the how can we resource it you know in these regions how can we create 
you know, the abundance of food, fiber, shelter, all of these things in these regions that are both changing and that are both just disintegrated and destroyed by the, you know, mechanisms of capitalist growth and development, all the concrete that's, you know, suffocating whole habitats, all the drained uh, swamps and uh, peat bogs and things like that, that are, you know, being just sucked up into the machine, all the forests that have been clear cut, you know, in the interest of, uh, saving the fucking world, you know, <laughs> of healing our broken ecology, you know, we need to have a true economic system, a true system of managing the earth's natural resources, and going beyond that to uh, create systems that allow us to collaboratively plan, you know, the restoration of ecosystems. So that's something I would love to get your perspective on and to talk about how uh, ecologically based solutions can both provide more of abundance through things like centropic farming, which I'm not that familiar with, but it seems like a very interesting concept of like a, a kind of large scale food forest that we could use to grow things like bamboo and hemp that we could use to make all anything from, you know, fibers to graphene to, you know, pro more intense technological processes of making steel and things like that to continue our, you know, usage of technology that allows us to both weather the coming storm and to continually increase our quality of life and our ease of access to the things that we need. How can, um, how do I phrase this as a question? Uh, what is the scalability and the process and the viability of pulling carbon out of our atmosphere through these regenerative practices and through creating, you know, uh, the need, meeting the needs that we have as human beings through a different kind of ecological relationship. Yeah, that's a loaded one. Um, there, there's a couple different pieces to that question. <laughs> that, you're not going to get like how yes, high, yes. how are you from me anymore? I'm sorry. Yeah. T yeah. Clock's ticking. Uh, there, there's a couple different pieces to this um, and I'll, I'll try to break them out as best as I can. The first one is the technology component. And with technology, you know, we, we have an incredible capacity to uh, utilize the technology that already exists, to uh, restructure the technology that exists. And, um, you know, we, with small changes, make that technology last significantly longer. And without, without the capitalist mindset of profitability, that's not a hard thing to do. Uh, that retooling is not, you know, necessarily impossible. So there's real opportunity in terms of utilizing technologies and trying to use that to pinpoint how we can most effectively uh, apply change. Now, in terms of the ecological component, um, you know, the reality is when we talk about things like, and I don't really like the phrase food forest because I, I think it it erases the fact that every forest is a food forest, just for for whom, really, and how is it a food forest? And I think that gets lost when you, you start defining it as this other thing. And um, that's something I, you know, again, with permaculture, it's kind of human-centered and specifically Western understanding of human-centered. And that that kind of conflates how we how we build food systems that are resilient and how people have traditionally lived on these landscapes. So if we're trying to build food systems that are um, inclusive of all people's needs and uh, all non-humans needs, and how does that integrate into uh, a greater climate change response? Uh, first, we can't solve climate change, at least not in the short or medium term. Like that is coming, whether or not we want it to. And at this point, all we can do is try to mitigate the damage. And um, in that sense, it's not a something to be a solution necessarily. In terms of thinking about this ecological challenge as a uh, a util a, an opportunity, even for what food systems of the future look like uh you know the chestnuts you plant today won't produce for a decade um the hickories for a decade or really two until they produce anything meaningful and uh you know you think about where the climate's going to be in 2052 or 2042 i guess uh and that's very different than um you know what we're thinking about today and that means we have to fundamentally rethink about our relationship and the the facet of time in that relationship with our ecology and as humans we forget that our lifespan in terms of the ecology around us is incredibly short so 
addressing these issues isn't about us individually, but us setting up the framework for future generations to begin this process of healing. And I think that can be really difficult for people because we're, we're, we're not, we don't live in a time where we think that way, even if historically we have. And I, I don't, I worry that that is a really difficult thing for us to wrap our heads around. And it shouldn't be, it should be, it should be something that frees us from our, our individual concerns and our individual fears into something greater and bigger and more meaningful. And it should, instead of making us feel small, make us feel uh, a part of something much bigger the way religion for many people does. And um, that to me ultimately is what ecology should be for all of us is a way for us to reconnect with something bigger than all of us and more important than all of us. And, you know, for us to make those re relationships with our ecology, we have to think about how we connect the world we live within to that ecology. And that needs to be in some, in some sense a physical space um, and a physical place where we can connect with other people um, and find this common ground and build those connections within our community around a common, a common good, a common cause around what we, what we know is fundamentally human, which is working with our ecology. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't well um, I couldn't be happier to hear, you know, that line of discourse that that's really where our energy needs to be going, you know, into building physical structures that are cooperative, that are collective, that, you know, creating, uh, you know, communities, co communalism. I mean, that's communism. I mean, creating communes, like living together, sharing the burden of having a farm of you know, taking care of animals, of meeting our basic needs. So that's just the basic thing. I mean, it just takes so much labor and effort to do everything on your own. It's it's so stupid that we do this, that we are a social organism that evolved to work collectively and distribute decision making and tasks. And we have evolved ourselves into this stupid pyramid where we're all co paradoxically subjugated under these consolidated entities of corporations, yet we're completely alone and individualized. And the left has no cohesive church has no cohesive movement of saying, okay, we are all mostly those leftists that I see on the internet are exploited fucking servants, you know, wage slaves. And they're, they're posting memes in the bathroom about burning cop cars and shit, you know, to foment their, or to get out their frustration at their lack of mobility and freedom and, and, you know, the ability to meet their needs in any way and have any free time. And so I commend them for doing something, not just doing nothing. But I think we need to work together to figure out how do we come together and share the cost of living? How do we come together and get land and purchase and create you know, how low cost housing efficiently with natural materials? How do we create an energy system? How do we create a food system? How do we create online structures that allow us to find each other and to organize and to collaborate and to create mutual aid networks, real networks? You know, and the, uh, the dual power app is uh, by Black Socialists of America is creating an an app like that, that I, I really want to talk to them soon and, and see what they're working on in that spirit, like, because I think that's really what we need. You know, all of our energy is going into these parasitic platforms and then to just the fucking sloppy waste of just like I, I did my laundry today and it took two fucking hours and I had to like strap myself into a machine that burns fossil fuels and drive several miles to like run water through clothing. And it was just absurd. I just, I, I had to talk about this guy. I saw this woman, this, she had three kids and they just all had like a different device. And she was just sitting there like watching the the spinning laundry, just like just like in misery, just suffering so much because she has to take care of her children and do her laundry and do all these things. And it's just like we were not supposed to live like this. And this is a tragedy that every person in this society is going through to just do the dumbest things, the simplest shit, like go to the goddamn grocery store. You know, to, to get a fucking carrot that you can take a bite <laughs> or bite out of. Sorry, I had to use my comedic prop. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we need to divert our energy into creating physical structure, building dual power, creating an actual movement. And, and let's talk. Come on, let's talk, people. It's definitely a challenge for people to make that next step. And um, it's, it's hard. Uh, I, I completely understand how difficult that can be. And to do that... Um, you know, when we think about getting outside of the the atomization of the way we live, is just it's it feels impossible. Even when we want to 
we we spend time you know i'll just pick on myself like you've got bees you've got sheep you've got chickens we're doing all these things isolated instead of in communities where it would make a lot more sense for one person to be the bee guy and do all of those things and one person do these other things uh but instead we're all just totally isolated and trying to do everything ourselves and that even though we're always talking about like you know, we're leftists, we believe in these, this idea of community and building these networks, when it comes to the way we live our daily lives, it doesn't ever dip into that, into that part of our, into how we work and how we identify and how we, how we actually do things. While we're on the subject of creating tangible um, action steps and actually working together offline and getting things done. I want to do a shameless plug for our social medias because while we we don't want you all out there listening and viewing this to be mindless, uh, drooling metaverse zombies and just stay online perpetually consuming shit and, and feeling helpless and immobile stick stuck on your mobile device we do want you to get out in the world and build these things and make this progress but in order to do that we do have to agitate and that's what our platforms are primarily um dedicated to uh so if you would please find us on the social media platform that you enjoy the most uh be it facebook tiktok instagram twitter pandora uh you know podbean spotify youtube you name it we're probably on it and of course our patreon and and give us a like one second of your time, a like, a share, a comment, anything of that nature, and you are supporting alternate media that is doing the work of agitation so that people can become aware and, and connect and then get offline and go out in the world and do these things. Thank you so much for doing that, Amanda. I hate doing that shit so much, and I have to do it every fucking episode. Well, you know, considering <laughs> that's what I spend a bulk of my time doing these days and have for, for some time, uh, I do have qualms with realizing that my hands are doing virtual work and not so much hands-on work these days. Uh, I, I have, to, I, I have to, to promote you a little bit, Amanda. I said this before we uh, went live, but... um. You're a me you're like a meme queen extraordinaire. Like you're meme queen supreme. Like all these like 22 year old kids that are like posting all their memes. You're like you just put them all to shame. You're like an you're like an ocean trawler that's just like like getting these huge nets of fish and just distributing them. You're like a combine harvester of the memes, just <laughs> dunking them out there. Poor Pearl's Almanac. Uh, you guys Thank post you. amazing memes too. Like oh like yes, the meme, you do. I, I really remember the memes about Paw Paw. Those that shit made me laugh so hard, and it actually tangibly dosed somebody with some tangible, you know, real life information, like yeah. like the Pokemonification of of uh, <laughs> plants or something. You know, good. I, yeah, I just, I just really spread respect what you guys are doing and um uh, go ahead sorry yeah memes i think are this really cool tool that you can you know find common ground with people you wouldn't think of as being interested in finding common ground and uh utilizing that as a way to to drop the facade a little bit and um kind of break through the the wall between communities Yep, it's like a yep. virtual form of hieroglyphics. I, I swear, it's that, just it, it's it's what gets the message across. You know, serious. We did the same thing by trial and error too on on our Facebook page. We were trying to post articles and you know some solutions. It was a good mix of everything at first, and um, you know, and then we just noticed that hey, people like the memes, so the memes kept coming and kept coming and kept coming, and um, you know, now now we consistently post with some like five or seven a day, something like that probably i think is the kind of the sweet spot or something is that about right amanda six, six a day six on facebook day. four a day on instagram yeah. two a day on twitter uh and <laughs> um and we have a, a superstar go. on tiktok who does all of that and it's whenever he can <laughs> but uh yeah there's there's I, a balance a to it <laughs> I had a quick question because I hadn't heard this term before. Actually, I, I, maybe I'm just not as well versed in leftist circles as I as I should be. Um, but I had to actually go look it up. Uh, for our listeners that don't know, um, what is a a prol? P P R O. Mm. Yeah, P P R O L E. Right. Yeah. So that's just short for proletariat. Um, so like working class. Okay. A bloody bloke. It's short for proletariat. <laughs> working guy. Right? Yep. Yeah, so the whole idea was basically how do we play on King uh, or not King, uh, Poor Richard's Almanac, and focus recenter it on the working class, 
and um, basically provide that guidebook for the climates that we we're going to experience and uh, you know the skills that people need really. Another point I actually kind of wanted to reiterate while we were talking about like the whole ecosystem thing, I think um, we were talking about like this regenerative agriculture movement. Um, another individual we were talking about uh, named uh, Kwai a while back was was kind of they were like, really, the term is the term that we want to use more, I think, is agroecology, because I think that term kind of encompasses more of the side of the culture and the ecology around surrounding the agriculture and just the whole ecosystem itself, you know, rather than focusing on just the ag regenerative agricultural aspect of it we're actually focusing on a lot more when you when you kind of view it in the term of agroecology is is that understanding kind of correct yeah agroecology is definitely um it, it, ref, it reframes it within the class and the the working class peasant uh struggles it's very broad have, yeah exactly so basically the idea was always that with agroecology it was framed within the union organizing that was going on mm. with the via campesina in Central America, and the the folks that were working and continuing these traditional methods of uh, stewarding landscapes, and keeping it within uh, a framework that was based in the hmm. working class and the working class needs, as well as those particularly unique. Nice, nice. Yeah, and that, that was kind of one thing that I that I thought was a good distinction too. you know, separating just the regenerative side of it and going deeper into the whole cultural and community and cooperation and ecological side of it really kind of really kind of en envelops and encompasses a lot more that I think we really do need to take into consideration if, if we're going to do these things yeah, effectively sure. in the long term. Yeah, and to continue kind of maybe maybe close the loop here, because I think we're coming up on our time. Uh, to, of bridging, you know, ecological principles into our social design. I think it's rather than, you know, try to read a bunch of leftist theory and try to map it onto what we're doing. I, I just, I don't, I'm not personally that motivated by that stuff. I really like Murray Bookchin. I think he was a really sophisticated thinker who uh, incorporated a lot of contemporary thought and continually evolved and, you know, didn't get stuck in one thing, was always reinventing, was always changing. And I, I respect that, but I, I don't like sit around reading leftist theory. I don't find it useful. I don't find it compelling. Every now and then I'll read it and find like, like okay, there's some good stuff there. And it's cool to connect with that history, but we have just totally different needs today than anyone has ever dealt with before. And the true ideology, the true, you know, dictatorship uh, that that's going to conform what we do and what we must do is nature, is our ecological crisis that we have to adapt to our world, that we, all of our systems have become so bloated and, and hypothetical and estranged from reality that we no longer have a connection to the soil. We no longer have a connection to the food that we put in our mouths. I don't have any more carrots. I can't take any more comedic bites. <laughs> but um, we don't we don't have this connection to life. And life itself is something that is more hypothetical and something that is so it's it's harder to conceive than we under we have a better understanding most people have shit understanding of interest rates and inflation and all this junk but they understand that more than they understand erosion and they under you know like the natural processes of how water moves through an ecosystem and that is you know people like jeremy rifkin has said that is economy that is the real economy of the world is you know photosynthesis and we're learning that in a hard way and I think when we when we look at nature and we have a relationship with it, we see how it functions in this distributed, non-hierarchical way. There is no, uh, you know, king of the ecosystem. Even the apex predator is then devoured by the worm, you know, and they all feed the system that ultimately mm -hmm. circulates and moves that life force, that energy, and that resource of the calories and the sunlight that is in all of us. You know, it moves it through an ecosystem equitably, perfectly equitably where nobody is ballooning higher than the other. Somebody uh, saw a post today that was talking about how um, trees do not compete for sunlight, as, as was previously you know, thought. They, co they cooperate for it. They are communicating and you know, balancing themselves out like little solar panels so that they can maximize the health of their whole ecosystem because they know they're interdependent. And I think that principle that we all depend upon each other, that if shit hits the fan, you are only as good as your weakest link. And that is not a, a fascistic, you know, uh, throw the disabled people under the bus, you know, rhetoric as, as the fascists are going to take it is let the poor die, you know, let the weak die. But it's like you, we need to work to bring up everybody in our society to find their role in the community of life. I was thinking about this. I was watching 
you know, insects uh, pollinating these beautiful flowers as the leaves were changing. And I was just thinking about, you know, how much enmity people have for insects, you know, that they swat these, these essential, uh, you know, caretakers of life that are going around pollinating flowers and, you know, facilitating this growth of the, of the, the living world. Whereas we as humans are primarily parasitic consumers. We're not fostering life. We're taking it consistently. We're taking from each other. We're taking from the world around us. And we're not playing a role in, in, our, in an ecosystem. And as workers, we're not playing a role in society. We're just creating money for some fucking guy who's creating money for someone else. Who's ultimately creating money for a bank that's in debt to itself. <laughs> so yeah, we need to reconnect with our real roles. And I think that there's language that can be conveyed in that. And even like that in transliterating the anti-work movement to the conservative ideology that is like hard work makes you free. <laughs> Not to, I didn't mean to use the fucking slogan of Auschwitz, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's really, you know, the, the attitude. But yeah, I mean, we need to find our role in community and in society. And there's just so much... Um, purpose and uh, meaning to be developed in that and we can reclaim work we can move beyond it we can transcend all of these artificial limits and 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 ultimately when we realize these principles with enough of us together working at it finding our roles and and feeding you know and nurturing all the people in our society to be their best self to not be this withered little tuber you know to be it this ripe element that is feeding all the life around it, we can create an amazing society. Even in a world that is ravaged by climate change, we can still live well. I mean, we can we can create a much better system. And as the systems and the structures of money collapse all around us, there is a void in all of our minds and imaginations for something better that we can do together. I think that the prepper urge, and I talk to doomers about this a lot because they're my, they're my little brothers that I'm always bullying online. Uh, <laughs> because they need to go further in themselves, whatever. But the prepper urge is store up all the beans you can for the end of the world. When that ain't gonna work out well for you, someone's just gonna come take your fucking beans if you're just you. Or you're gonna rec realize, you know, there's things you can't do, that we need other people, that we need to do things together. We need to think about how do we adapt intelligently, emergently into a, a, a collective that takes care of itself. And we can truly create a utopian condition of eliminating all the pointless bullshit jobs and the stresses and the you know i don't know i just think about the the beautiful adaptation that uh like hunter gatherers had to their environment they knew their environment so fucking well they could be living in a desert and still having like a 3,000 calorie a diet day you know where there's no stress where they just they know their environment they're adapted to it they're working together socially there's no fucking boss telling them what to do there's no stress there's no inequality they got it figured out we can do that again at a higher a higher level with fucking hydrogen cells and solar panels that we make out of fucking algae and all this regenerative solutions in this field of, of, of possibilities that exists. It's just not being I tapped. love that point. That is such a gorgeous point. You're basically pointing out how not only are we so very detached from our environment and what what is an extension of us, but we're afraid of it because of the institutions we've given rise to through global lo logistics, like uh, you know, food food supply chains and stuff. Um, it just blows my mind that we're afraid of the environment we live in because we've been so domesticated, as Andy was saying in the beginning of the episode, uh, to a degree that, you know, if it doesn't come off of a store shelf like your your comedic carrot, um, we're afraid to touch it. We're afraid to eat it. We're afraid to consume it or, or even recognize it as something um, relevant to our existence. Uh, that's That's what's nearly unfathomable to me. I just had to insert that sorry hang on celery <laughs> what are you bugs bunny andy. today yeah it's funny is this, is this andy you just got like a bowl of salad makings here. sitting next to you yep um andy we're coming running up on time here but i would love for you to ease us on out here with your sultry podcast voice bunch up on that mic get that proximity effect yeah well uh... increase, increase the bass <laughs> And, uh, oh, you got the RE20. <laughs> There's no proximity effect. Light it up. Um, yeah, bring us on home here. I mean, let's tr try to find some insight. Try to tap the oak tree of, the, of our conversation and, uh, you know, produce yeah. a little bit of uh, that sweet um, syrup. It all ultimately comes down to what... <laughs> it's maple tree. It all maple tree. ultimately exactly. comes down to what you're willing to do. <laughs> and Close. 
um, without you making the effort, nothing's going to change. And that sounds cheesy, but, um, you know, plant a tree, go for a hike, go, go talk to your neighbors, give them some sugar, something, do something, anything that that's what's missing is doing something. As long as hierarchy persists, as long as domination organizes humanity around a system of elites, the project of dominating nature will continue to exist and inevitably lead our planet to ecological extinction.